have um, an hour ahead. Um, we have two presenters, two scientific deputy, deputy ambassadors from Bulgaria and Hungary. So, um, Mr. Alexander Angelov and Mr. Gergely Nadori, who are today going to be uh, presenting one-to-one -one and end-to-one -one, uh, teaching methods in STEM education. Um, so, thank you very much for uh, conducting this uh, webinar, uh, Alexander and uh, Gergely. I'm soon going to be passing on the uh, ball to uh, you. So, um, the meeting is going to, the webinar is going to uh, last for 45 minutes and uh, it's going to close with a 15 minutes long discussion. So, uh, please, uh, everybody, uh, Prepare your questions for the end uh, discussion and uh, towards the end of the 45 uh, minutes you can start raising your questions by using the chat function. Uh, we will now start with Mr. Alexander Angelov. So I will pass on the floor to him. And after uh, Mr. Angelov will have uh, uh, the next part of the session by Mr. Gelgeli Nadori. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening, rather, and uh, thanks uh, to Sophia for the introduction, and uh, thanks to the whole European Schoolnet team for organizing uh, the Scientix webinars and um, carrying this one over 2015. Um, I will get uh, to the point immediately, mining that there are like uh, 20 minutes uh, for <coughs> for my part. Uh, first. Um, I really appreciate that uh, we could organize this webinar on two topics, uh, to go from abstract and from the concept to the very hands-on experience. And um, we'll be splitting the agenda into parts equal in duration. Um, Gagel will be sharing, um, let's say, more about the hands-on experience in physics classes. And I will be speaking more about the concept of one-to-one -one and one-to-one, -one, and that's uh, why and how I introduce it. So uh, right now I'll be switching uh, the view to my screen. Just give me a second to do that. Okay, I hope uh, you are able to see my screen, right? Great. Uh, so that's the title. Uh, I'll be using Sway. Uh, it's a new tool to present uh, the slides, and there are really not, not too many of them. Um, I use background known from the little prince. Um, background shows the little prince and the fox. And uh, there is a storyline over there that the fox wants to be tamed. And taming is one thing to make um, one miss the other one and really feel its emotions. So if we are to introduce one-to-one uh, -one or end-to-one, -one, not just mining devices, but also people peer-to-peer um, -peer or learner-to-educator uh, learner or student-to-student, -student, we first really have to learn how to tame each other. And in that way, uh, maybe we'll be eased to do that. Okay, going to the next slide then. Um, that's me. You'll be, I'm not switching the camera on since the connection might go worse, but um, I'm working for the Center for Creative Training in Bulgaria, and generally we are training teachers, but we have also other field of expertise, and that's a picture I took in the office. Okay, um, the title says there is one-to-one -one and also maybe a next level. Generally, the concept of one-to-one -one is that um, Eventually, every student will have a device uh, to look at. Um, but right now, I'll be opening a resource which is uh, announced in the invitation if you had a chance to uh, check it out. Okay. Um, it's an official report by the European Commission uh, that brings an overview of the one-to-one -one learning initiatives all across Europe. And uh, European Schoolnet is also very much involved in this report. 
And I want to emphasize on one of the very first sentences here. Just give me a second. I can't find the exact paragraph, but that's not uh, the main point of it. Uh, the uh, preface uh, actually underlines that the one-to-one -one is not that much about one device to one student, but it's more about um, one's attention to the other one's attention. And uh, in that aspect, uh, methodology uh, seems to have the upper hand uh, over technology. Uh, which is uh, very much um, outlined on page 34 and page 41 and 42. I'll be just jumping over there to show you the exact paragraphs. Um, to point eight. Yeah. Um, one of the very uh, much anticipated parts in this report is the training because one of uh, it seems that the training is what is missing in uh, implementing one to one um, I would like to have uh, to have your attention on those four points right now. over here, especially on the first one. Self-organized training sessions established by these schools involved in the project. So it seems that all across Europe, there are quite a lot one-to-one uh, -one learning models uh, that developed bunches of technology, thousands of computers to tens of thousands of students in uh, maybe every, every European Union country and also the neighboring countries, but Generally, there was no training provided besides the training provided eventually by the company that deployed the equipment. So it looks like uh, the equipment comes before the training, and then there is this uh, strange situation now from chess that nobody can make a move or it will lose. Um, and that's uh, something that really uh, it's obvious even in Bulgaria because I've been uh, witnessing a lot of one-to-one -one implementations all across the country. And it seems that uh, everybody who receives a bunch of equipment or a classroom being equipped is waiting then to get a training. And if not such training appears, generally the equipment either stays locked or it's been used in uh, out-of-school activities. There is somehow uh, a limitation uh, or a restriction rather from uh, from the teacher who should use the equipment to know uh, to just not to use it because nobody trained him how to do it. Um, and look at point number three here, that training offered by specialized centers or universities only happened in Greece. And this is an official report by the European Commission. So it looks like that uh, people everywhere but not in Greece had to train by themselves or they just got technology technological companies to, to train them. But there is not no really specialists in teacher training to develop and offer such training to the users, which is kind of strange fact. Um, and this is something that universities should really concern about be concerned about because um, there is no reason to educate future teachers that uh, will be educated the very same way as the teachers that are going to be retired now. And then everybody would like to have the teacher with a better experience uh, since the initial training is all the same. And then what about young people being teachers and what's the motivation? And it seems like um, there is no, no sufficient dialogue between the high university uh, high, higher education providers and the practitioners in school. Maybe there is something that universities also have to teach from teachers. But that's not a conclusion, just a, a discussion point, let's say. Uh, 
I will um, close this report right now and go to more practical things. Yeah. Um, I would like to pass uh, the presentation to Gagili when we speak about end to one, and this is something that uh, the team I work uh, with kind of uh, agreed on. Um, that currently students don't teach, don't don't learn one to one, even though we are trying to, you know, present this is the new thing. It looks like it's all thing already, <laughs> which can happen any second now, and. Um, that's a picture of uh, two very young person uh, learning to count book and a doll. Uh, and I find it uh, very suitable uh, to represent that in every single moment, every single, every single young person is in contact with more than one source of information, which was not the case uh, just, you know, like, 12 or 15 or, or more years ago when we were sitting 28 young people in one room and we had one source of information for 28 of us. Um, so it's not one-to-one -one anymore, it's end-to-one, endless sources of information to every single young learner. And we should be very quick to adapt this one. So. Uh, those are two pictures have um, been taken in classrooms. I don't know where, just find it over the internet. But my experience uh, observing quite a lot of lessons when there are devices in the rooms show that this environment uh, stays just for five minutes. So I, I wrote below the pictures, first five minutes. So uh, they have the, the devices over there. They have specific tasks. And for five minutes, everyone pays attention to his or her own device. And then, on the sixth minute, we see this. So she's touching her device, and she will be asking some, somewhere else, and every, everything starts to be kind of a, a little mess, and students running and, and uh, shouting and whatsoever. Uh, but it seems that one-to-one -one is not really static, and it's not. One-to-one um, -one happens when you drop the technology for five minutes, and then you immediately get end-to-one. Because students, that, that's the way young people do it. You can't limit them. And if you try to bring order in this, uh, in this setup, you have to kill the internet connection, or you have to take the, the device out and then bring it to the old traditional one to 28. So it's impossible, and it requires different, totally, radically different approach. And I will stop here with this, I will not call it provocation, but yeah, rather sharing of thoughts, and I'll go further. Yeah, and my discussion question will be, um, what is more important when integrating technology in this end-to-one -end model? The educator's needs or the learner's needs? And who has to adapt, learners to the educator, or the educator to the learners. And then if we, uh, and the background picture is about the comfort zone, so if we want to stay in our comfort zone, that definitely is not going to be the learner's comfort zone. Be sure about it. Unless you feel comfortable in this and everybody running and shouting, but... Okay. Uh, there is something else. Um, I was thinking to expand this abbreviation uh, BYOD, but rather not. It stays for bring your own device, and generally it's an organizational decision to allow everybody to bring whatever device and to assist learning with it. Um, going back to the report, and you can find the report also here. Uh, event and today's event it's announced in detail. Uh, those are the uh, hyperlinks to the reports uh, in the presentation. So be free to check it out over there. Um, you can you can find basically you can find every all the information you need on the um, webinar announcement. Um, 
bring your own device uh, should be structurized. And it can be a very, very successful approach uh, if you initially build a, how can I say, organizational idea how it can look like. And it can look like a mess, but it can look very, very much organized like this picture. Um, and right now I, I will go to the next slide, which I fi uh, find very attractive. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, we have four type of devices here. I think the first two already merged. Let's say it's a smartphone. So line one, a smartphone, then a tablet, then a PC, or a fully functional computer, which is the term I'll, I will rather use. So what can a device actually do? Uh, they all can browse the internet. They all can look at pictures and videos. Uh, the, the smartphone and tablet are rather good at taking pictures uh, by camera or video camera. The laptop not, not because of the camera is so bad, but because it just sticks to the front. Uh, and then you have video and photo editing, where I would rather skip the smartphone and eventually the tablet, because it's very simple app-based video and picture editing. But if you have uh, your class already in typing, that means that the tablet and the smartphone are not really that usable um, because of the keyboard. And it's not about keyboard lovers or keyboard, ha keyboard haters, or if you can use the on-screen keyboard and so on. Um, it's the ability to at least uh, get reasonable typing speed. And for that, you really need a keyboard. And if you want to teach programming or wiki, blogging or journalism, or if you have classes on uh, uh, extracurriculum topics or, or um, something that requires more than an uh, internet search, then you definitely need a computer rather than an iPad or a, or, or a smartphone. So looks like bring your own device can work in some classes, but not in all classes. And in that aspect, uh, it's a challenge to the agenda, the weekly or monthly or yearly agenda about a specific class uh, to have those classes that really require a keyboard and a PC uh, not being sacrificed because of bring your own device um, policy in the school. Um, that's a strong point to have and have it in consideration. Uh, I want to go back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I really like this one, and I really believe that teachers are more leaders than bosses. Um, let's have a short glimpse of this uh, picture. Mm, shows the difference between the boss and the leader. And um, just to develop one step further, I would ask you not just to put yourself in the position of a boss or a leader, but also to try bring all the students in the position of leaders, at least on some points. Yeah, they are, they are leaders and they are followers, like uh, it used to be like that since the, I don't know, ages. Um, but Generally, um, more appreciation and behavior and leadership in the classroom is always uh, helping. And especially when technology is used, cooperation and teamwork is uh, a pillar of a successful classroom. Yeah, uh, this is a very nice example of what, how can one feel when there are 25 devices dropped in the classroom and they tell you, okay, tomorrow you start, and then the huge animal starts to run after you. Um, okay, um, so the, the better you get, the better training you receive, more successful you'll be escaping this beast, but then I will just provoke by, say that, uh, by saying that you can also try to tame the animal. So this uh, hungry, angry beast, huge feet, small arms, open mouth, 
can do a lot of things for you. And if you find technology a beast chasing you, try very simple taming tricks. And there is a huge chance it will it will work. Um, and then you can make the beast uh, do some job for you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there is there are existing training curriculums for teachers and also for practitioners how to use uh, technology and one to one and also how to handle like 100 devices in one classroom and how to do more with it. Uh, get a good search on the internet, watch some videos, and there will be at least some ideas. Okay, uh, my time is almost out, um, and I will be uh, stressing on some points here. Uh, one outcome that uh, I can say comes from real practice is that when there is one-to-one -one implementation in the school, when there are some devices dropped in the classroom, if not pedagogical outcomes and huge academic success in the classroom, at least the teachers dramatically improve their ICT skills and awareness. That's at least. Of course, it is quite a big investment just to, to bring this awareness and um, skills up, but still it's a very direct and very, uh, the very quick outcome. And if we speak about students, they doesn't matter what you do with the devices, they just say school is more cool. I didn't develop this one more cool, like uh, engagement and attention and so on, because it varies from culture to culture, from country to country and school to school, and you know, I can go forever with it. Um, but when something's cool, then you remember it. If you remember it, then it gives you more associations. So my question to any, every one of you will be, do you remember what you did on 29th of January last year? If you don't remember, that means that you didn't do anything cool then. So uh, if you, okay, maybe it was cool, but not that much. If you had your birthday on 29th of January, then you definitely remember. You remember who you invited, uh, what kind of party you had, was it at home or you were sick or whatever. Uh, because birthday is associated with something cool. So making school cool is great. And every tool that makes you make school cool is great as well. Um, okay, uh, when you have equipment in your classroom, please pay attention to the four, uh, to the right side, uh, right hand side, who will provide you the support, who will provide you with warranty and for how long. Do you have enough devices if one breaks down to replace it and not to kick the student out of the classroom? And be sure to sign an insurance paper, whoever pays for it. It generally costs just coins, so a few euros per year even, but it can cover all the expenses and will save you a lot of headache, not to explain to the school board or to the principal and not to argue with parents who should pay for Mary's computer because it fell down the chair or the table and somebody kicked it and stepped two feet over it. And you can't imagine how much of comfort you, you buy with two euros. There is, come on, <laughs> it's a huge, huge portion of comfort. Okay, um, I would really like to thank you for your attention. I will just try to have the camera on for a second, not to compromise the um, connection quality, maybe, maybe not, just to try. Mm. Okay, and then I'll be passing the floor to Gagli uh, Naduri from Hungary. I really appreciate it. Uh, he agreed to share his hands-on experience. It would be a challenge for me to, to get such an example. He will be telling you more about uh, LabCam and how eventually one-to-one uh, -one can be transformed to end-to-one -to -one in practical science classes. I really hope you enjoyed. I'll be here, of course, uh, during the whole webinar and answering your questions. I'll be stopping the sharing right now. And 
Hello everyone. Uh, my t-shirt went to the washing machine, so I have my blue shirt right now. But if you really are keen on to see the t-shirt picture, you're welcome to go on our website. It's over there. And uh, Giggly, it's you now. We don't hear you. At least I don't hear you. Uh, that's too bad. Yeah, it's great. Right now it's working. Go on. It's working. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I've put out two links, uh, which link to things that I will be talking about. And now I will try to share my presentation with you. And it is, here it is. So uh, I will uh, be talking about one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one in practice, how it works uh, uh, in a science classroom, um, and uh, my experiences with that. Before that, why, why I started out and why I uh, uh, did this little research that I have done. Uh, we all know that Francis Bacon was uh, the uh, founder of evidence-based science uh, around uh, 400 uh, years ago. And uh, uh, more than uh, 300 years later, uh, Archie Cochrane founded evidence-based medicine which was uh, uh, a kind of medicine uh, based on uh, controlled trials, uh, learning what works and what not. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Ben Goldecker, who is a wonderful science writer, uh, maybe you have met his book uh, titled Bad Science. It's very, very interesting. It's, it's a very good book. He wrote uh, a piece about... Uh, the need for evidence-based education. Uh, he wrote about uh, how many uh, different methods we use without knowing if they work or not. And he proposed using uh, the same kind of uh, trials that we use in uh, medicine uh, to learn which method works and which does not. Uh, and as I was thinking about uh, using uh, ICT uh, computers in, in uh, my science classroom, uh, I, I like these tools very much, and I like to use them a lot. Um, but there wasn't a lot of research about uh, how much they really help uh, the students in learning, uh, or how much they really transform their learning. So I decided that uh, I was in a position to make my own research uh, and made my research. So here is what I have done. Uh, it was more than a year ago that I, I, I did this. Uh, in my uh, school, <clears throat> which is the alternative high school of economics in Budapest, uh, I was teaching two classes uh, in the ninth grade. And uh, it was the same school, uh, it was the same teacher, me. Uh, the classes were uh, uh, divided randomly, so there was no better class or worse class. Uh, beforehand, they had the same background of science, and uh, there was no difference between the previous results uh, between the two classes. So. I decided that I can use one of them as a control group and the other as, uh, as uh, uh, the group doing uh, uh, some kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, teaching them the physics of motion, and we had uh, 20 lessons, uh, actually two lessons at a time uh, for 10 days. Uh, that uh, we studied this subject. Uh, 
what I did was that I gave to one of the uh, groups uh, problems on paper as uh, homework. Uh, if you teach physics, then you are uh, familiar with these. Uh, in motion, there are a lot of these uh, uh, problems. Calculate the distance traveled, calculate the acceleration, uh, calculate the time needed for the fall, and so on and so on. And uh, the homework of the other group was to use uh, a software uh, called the uh, Webcam Laboratory uh, in, with which uh, they had to make demonstrations of the different types of movement that we studied. This was a small difference. Otherwise, what happened in the classroom was the same for all of uh, the students. So there was no difference uh, uh, between what I told them, what we did in the, in the classroom. Uh, the only difference between the two groups was this, and, and um, it was my intention to have uh, uh, only a small change and, and see if this has an effect or not. Uh, Webcam Laboratory is a, a software uh, produced by Intelligence. Uh, I put uh, uh, the uh, link uh, in the chat, uh, and uh, right now, it is part of the Intel school uh, package, but I was talking to them and, and they told me that uh, uh, in a couple of weeks uh, it will be available from the Chrome store. So if you have a, a Windows machine, then you can buy uh, this software. It will cost about $3, so it's not a, not a really uh, expensive uh, software. It has several modules. The ones, the one that I used uh, uh, with the students here was the kinematics module. Uh, what it does that uh, uh, through the camera of the laptop or through a webcam, it tracks the motion of objects. And uh, then uh, makes a graph of it and even a, a table with the data that it publishes. And with this, uh, they could uh, uh, make demonstrations of uh, uh, accelerating motion, uh, motion with negative uh, uh, acceleration uh, or even motion and so on. And, uh, and they had to write a report about it and there, what, what they have uh, uh, studied, what are the results, uh, uh, they copied the graphs there, and that, that was that they had to do. Uh, at the end of this uh, uh, 20 class uh, period, uh, both groups had an assessment. It was a test uh, of four parts. It had uh, four different types of questions. Uh, there was one part about the theory of motion, the uh, laws of Newton uh, and the concepts of force and acceleration and uh, impulse. There were calculations uh, with motion, these traditional problems. Uh, there were practical applications like uh, uh, What uh, would you need to uh, increase the friction uh, of a car, or uh, if something moves in a certain way, how it will continue moving, things like that. And there were also questions about the history of science, because during these 20 classes, we studied about the great figures uh, in physics, Newton, Galilei, uh, Hamilton, and so on. So it was also part of the things that they had to study. And uh, here are the results. Uh, the orange is the class that used the webcam laboratory software, and the blue is the one that did not use the webcam laboratory software. 
Uh, as you can see, the, the, the group using the webcam laboratory was better uh, in all uh, of these, though only the ones uh, which are signed with an asterisk uh, are significant differences. And uh, actually, uh, this that uh, some parts of the test had no significant uh, uh, differences between the two groups uh, really shows me that something happened here uh, with uh, the use of this tool. Uh, as you can see, uh, the differences are not uh, uh, significant uh, for the history of science, as you could expect, and uh, not significant for the calculations. Uh, but there is a significant and quite large uh, uh, difference with, uh, with the practical applications uh, the theory of motion, and the average result all in all. Um, and I, I didn't put up here the standard deviations, but, uh, but these differences are about one and a half standard deviation, uh, or, and one between one and a half and one standard deviation, so quite big one. Um, I, I did some further study of the data, though I, I had very small sample size, uh, uh, 28 and 27 students in the two groups. Uh, and I, I tried to see if there is a difference between boys and girls and the effect on boys and girls. And uh, uh, looks like that for boys, even the calculations were significant. Uh, and I also tried to uh, uh, put them in uh, different groups based on uh, how well they performed on the task. Uh, if using the, the software helped more the better students or the uh, uh, poor uh, uh, students who, who had uh, poorer results, uh, there was no difference between that. So they, it, it, the difference is the same uh, mostly for boys and girls and, and, and for better or, or poorer students. Um, one year later, uh, I was interested if there is any uh, uh, remaining effect, uh, long time effect. So uh, one year later, I, I gave them another test. It's, uh, uh, I guess any of you as a teacher uh, can know that it's not fair uh, testing your students in something that they have learned a year ago. Uh, I still did it. So I, I gave them this Forces Conceptions Inventory, which is a standardized, a standard uh, uh, test of 30 questions. Uh, about uh, the concepts of uh, motion and forces. And uh, the webcam group uh, was better on this. Not much better. They, uh, this, this forces concept is, uh, 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 was first uh, uh, designed for college level students, entry college level students in America. Um, and uh, so, here they got around 10 points and uh, the webcam group around 11, but the difference was not significant. So probably it's uh, uh, not that much of an effect. Uh, finally, about uh, what can be the lessons learned from this study for me. Uh, uh, one thing is that even uh, a small uh, use of the one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, method can make a difference. So it, it can make a difference in your uh, uh, classroom if you try to use these uh, tools. The other thing that I uh, have been thinking about, whether it is the uh, 
the Hawthorne effect that we are seeing here. Uh, the Hawthorne effect was uh, an effect that uh, uh, they found in a, the Hawthorne light bulb factory. Uh, the researchers were uh, interested in what kind of changes uh, would improve the efficiency of the workers, whether they have better lighting or poorer lighting, whether the uh, tables are higher or uh, lower and so on. And uh, uh, to their amazement, they found that every change has an increased effectivity. So something new uh, makes you uh, pay more attention. Something new uh, helps you do your uh, job better. So it can be that, that it was a new tool for them. Uh, it was a new way of learning for them, so they had to uh, pay more attention, they were more motivated, they were more interested. And if it is true, then it's good. Why not use the whole turn effect if it works? The other thing that, that I liked uh, uh, very much was that uh, uh, even this small uh, practice with uh, with this one-on-one -on -one, uh, where they had to design their own demonstrations of the movement uh, where uh, they had to work uh, on their own uh, uh, devices. Even this uh, 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 had an effect on how they can uh, apply to the practical everyday situations what they have learned. I, I have the feeling that a lot of times uh, what we teach in science uh, is uh, in a different slot in our students' heads from their everyday exp experiences. They have their uh, school knowledge. That's how you should answer a question in school. And they have their uh, uh, everyday knowledge. And a lot of times these two have no, nothing in common. Uh, and here, uh, that at home, they had to work with the computers, they had to put together these things, uh, made it real what we were working with, much more than uh, uh, solving uh, problems on paper. So these are the lessons for me, and uh, I really am encourage everybody to uh, do uh, these little experiments if you can, uh, because you can learn a lot about uh, your own teaching uh, from these. So uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, that was what I wanted to tell. I guess now we can start uh, with the questions and answers. Thank you very much to you both uh, for sharing your experiences. And indeed, now we can uh, take some uh, questions from uh, the participants. Um, you may want to use the chat, or otherwise you can always raise your hand and ask the question directly to the presenters. I'll pass on the question to the first person here to, yes. yes. Please uh, go ahead and ask a question, Lydia.
Dear colleagues, you will have to unmute the microphone before asking your question, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. Or you can just uh, type it into your chat uh, window and then do it. In the meantime, if anybody else has a question, they can already prepare it on the chat. That way we win time. And it will be easy also for the presenters to pick up your questions. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me, Alex? Absolutely. Uh, I want to thank you about your presentation and uh, Gergely also. And uh, I have not a uh, question, but I have uh, comments for, this, for your presentation. I totally agree with you that uh, the teachers should improve their ICT skills and awareness, but um, I think that they can and then uh, they should improve uh, their hands-on uh, skills. They can improve their uh, skills in uh, experiments also. And I totally agree with uh, this part of your presentation that uh, presents uh, teachers to be not like boss and uh, like uh, partner. Uh, I think that uh, in this world, uh, teachers should be the partner of students and uh, should uh, um, try to to find their um, very their interest, interest in, in science, maybe. And I think that in uh, different Europe countries should be more, uh, uh, more um, institution like you, like this creative center, uh, and like our astronomy observatory, because we are, we prepare a lot of students uh, in this field, one to one. Uh, practice, of course. And this is important to, to break this education system in which students are uh, disappointed from our lessons. We hope to, to make uh, our lesson more interesting, more attractive with ICT and with hands-on experiments. Um, well, thanks, Virginia, for your comments. Uh, I'll just allow myself a sentence and then I'll pass the floor to Gagli. He'll be answering your question in the chat. Um, I recently seen Sir Ken Robinson live last week. Um, if you're interested, you can try finding in the internet Sir Ken Robinson. Um, he speaks a lot about creativ creativity and education, and um, his point was that the change of the educational system starts from the classroom. Uh, and everybody can make a significant change if we all think about similar changes to apply. Uh, this is one thing. And yes, I really believe that all across the, I don't know about the world, but uh, all across Europe, there is certain need of cooperation between different type of educational organizations and experts to improve the classroom experience in general. It's not between just classroom to classroom. There should be the observatory, the training center, the university, the local authority, parents, classrooms, students, formal, non-formal, informal, and everything. And that will bring the change. So I perfectly agree, and uh, thanks. Um, Gagli, what about the question in the chat? Yeah, I, I, I had two questions. Uh, the first was, uh, if I have any comparison between the two groups before the experiment, and what were the differences between the groups before? 
uh, I have been teaching them uh, for two years before, so they, they, we, we knew each other very well, these two groups. Um, there was no difference, no significant difference between their results. So uh, even in the, in the previous two years, they had the same results. Uh, I checked the, if there is a statistical difference between them, but there was none. Uh, and uh, which material did the students get in addition to the webcam laboratory uh, sheets uh, or instructions? Of course, we had a lot of materials. They had their textbooks. Uh, they had uh, uh, different tasks that uh, we did in the classroom, but that was the same for the two groups. Uh, for the second group, which had the webcam laboratory, the only instruction was that these are the types of movements that we studied. Uh, here is the software. Make a demonstration on each of these types. Learn how to use the software. Uh, make a demonstration uh, on each of these types and write a report about it. That was all that they had to do with it. And uh, I asked them, uh, they were the first group uh, that I used because I, I was not sure how much time it will take them uh, to do that. Uh, I asked them that how much they worked with it. They said it was about two and a half hours that they spent on this uh, 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 task. Uh, so for the other group, the control group, I gave uh, 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 these problems to calculate uh, as a homework which were about, took about the same time for them to solve. So, because I didn't want to have one of the groups working more with the subject than the other. So, that's, that's how it worked. Uh, any more questions or comments? Uh, Don't be shy. Ask your questions now that you have the chance. Yeah, uh, someone asked when, uh, from when do you use this method? And what results or progress do you have? Uh, and if you have uh, uh, projects implemented? Uh, well, uh, one on one uh, uh, is something that I, I cannot use in all of my classes. Uh, only in some of my classes, but then there where I can use it, where they have uh, uh, their uh, devices that they can work with, I have a lot of pro uh, projects that I work on right now, uh, and uh, they work well. Also, uh, when we are talking about one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we should not forget that they are very, very good collaboration tools as well. So every student having a device doesn't mean that every student has to learn on his own. On the contrary, it means that it is a very good way of communication between groups of them or between uh, me and them. Uh, and uh, well, uh, so the uh, students told themselves how to use the software. Totally, they did. Uh, uh, sometimes when there is something really new that I want to uh, use with them, then I show it to them. But uh, I think uh, most of the tools that we use are really easy to use. And our students are very good in uh, getting up these skills. Uh, so if I can, I don't waste the time for teaching them the software. Um, if if I can add something uh, to complement uh, both the question, the Irina's question and Gagel here. Um, well, uh, when we speak about software, software has three key elements. One is interface, uh, how it looks. The second, not just how it looks, but what does what. The second one is functionality, what it does. And the third one is content. So, um, in my personal observation, um, students are very keen on discovering the functionality and not that keen discovering the content because they, you know, um, they get distracted quickly and don't really have the patience to go over all the content. 
and um, it is about finding the balance how you can uh, eventually to allow the students to discover the interface and functionality which for me is annoying can I find for most adults to be annoying because you see okay there are too much buttons it's too colorful everything pops up and whatsoever but they discover the interface and functionality and then you provide the content and then the real dialogue between student and the teacher happens uh, when you can ask eventually students to find an algorithm or to connect pieces of content to get the conclusion out by using this software then you rely in each other's skills and this is the so-called collaborative learning not just between students but also teacher involved in that so you rely on their skills and they rely on your knowledge and guidance and puts the position the teacher in the position of a guide rather than a distributor of information if this is not too long answer thanks uh, well we had, a, we had a question about uh, uh, Yudmila said that I'm afraid that students would lose some of their competences if they use uh, the smart devices in most of the time what do I think uh, uh, for instance uh, when uh, uh, we make experiments and uh, and uh, uh, they have to uh, make diagrams about the data uh, of the measurements. Uh, at the first time, I insist on them making it on paper. So they have to uh, measure the uh, length of the columns uh, on a millimeter paper and. Uh, also, I have them make uh, pie charts on paper, so they have to uh, calculate the de degrees and so on. But we de do it only once, and after that, uh, we can use Excel. And uh, I think that uh, it helps a bit uh, taking out the magic from uh, the devices, so it's not like uh, I... Uh, push the wizard but button and then it does something magic that I don't know what is and there is the result. Uh, they understand what is a, a, a pie chart or a, or a column chart, uh, but, uh, but we can be much, much more productive because after a time, uh, working with this uh, millimeter paper or, or uh, uh, with the, uh, calculating the degrees and so on on a pie chart is really troublesome. So why not why not work it faster? So um, I think uh, uh, what is important here uh, for you as a teacher to have a clear view of what kind of competencies you want to uh, have in your students, what kind of uh, 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 competencies uh, you want them to improve on and then design that way the whole learning process. Uh, if ICT can help in that, then use it. If it can't, then don't. So uh, if I can make an experiment in real life, I don't want them to watch a video about it. I want them to make it real life. Uh, if if uh, we study about uh, uh, nuclear energy, then I don't want them to uh, play with a little reactor in real life because uh, if it blows up it's not that nice so then we use a computer simulation and then they learn how it works and uh, uh, I, 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 I do not think that that ICT or, or uh, uh, all these smart devices are uh, uh, something that you should only use and 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 something that that should change everything in your teaching I think they are very nice tools uh, that you can add to your arsenal that you already have and um, as we're going to conclusion thanks Gagel and thanks for uh, the question again uh, to complement it and to get the same thing I've recently been to a concert and all the uh, you know the the youngest of the audience instead of looking at the band performing and the guitars jamming they had their screens <laughs> taking the video of the concert that they 
really were not that much about seeing the band and the show, but making video of it. What Gagli said about the experiment, yeah, they could do the experiment hands-on if it is possible. And then why not they record this experiment and try to share and explain to others, which is complemented by ICT actually. And something else as an example, if you imagine being at, at, at a camp, then you need basic survival skills, how to set fire and how to cook food and everything. But if you have your electronic flashlight based on LEDs in your smartphone, I don't have to waste all my matches to have my path alightened. I can use my smartphone. So technology can should be complementing our lives and um, making things quicker where it can be, not sacrificing our survival skills, but we shouldn't forget that we also need survival technology skills and we should also develop them. Um, now, I believe that time is almost up. If there are some last things, we you have our emails. Uh, Gagli maybe will be saying some final words and then the floor goes to the organizers. Thank you very much for your attendance. I really hope that next webinars will attract even more people outside Scientix. And guys, uh, to everybody we know, I'm really happy to, not, if not to see you, just to hear you and to know you there. So have a nice evening. That's for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, both for presenting and thanks everyone for attending this first uh, webinar uh, tonight. Uh, the webinar is uh, recorded and will be available uh, through the Scientix uh, website uh, soon. And uh, of course, this is the only, the only the first one of uh, several uh, similar events. So uh, as a uh, Alex already uh, pointed out, uh, yes, we hope to have uh, even more people attending uh, next time, but uh, let's uh, thank uh, Alex and uh, Gagli for actually taking up the challenge, being the first ones to taking up the challenge and uh, uh, sharing their wisdom with us. Have a good evening, everyone. And uh, if you indeed have any questions, you know that you can always ask them uh, even after the event has uh, uh, taken uh, place. <laughs>